Let's go to my hometown, H-Town, and talk to Ellie. What's up, Ellie? Hey, how are you? I'm all right. How about you? Pretty good. Very cool. So what's going on there in Houston, Texas? Okay. So my question is, how do you find the right partner, in my case, husband, after experiencing childhood sexual abuse? Hmm. Tell me, tell, I'm, I'm only smiling. You just like walked into my living room and you sound so kind and you're like, here's a grenade and I've pulled a pin and you'll have a great day. So tell me, tell me more. That's a huge sentence there. Tell me more about that. Um, so I was abused between the ages of seven and 11 by um, a really close family friend. Can I stop you? Can I stop you right there and say I'm sorry? Thank you. Do you but do, um, do you you know that shouldn't have happened, right? Yes. Okay. All right, good. Oh, yeah. oh, man. Okay. So seven to eleven. Um, did your parents know? They did not. They didn't find out until I was um seventeen. Okay. How'd they find and out? And it was um, my mom actually read something I had written, like the only time I had ever written anything down because I felt like I couldn't take it anymore. Mm-hmm. And, um, she had to go hunting for it too. So I guess, I don't know, but she, she found it, she read it and she lost it. Yeah. So they had, so, they had literally no idea. Mm-mm. Okay. Where's this guy now? Um, he is dead. He died. Okay. Mm-hmm. How did he pass away? A heart attack. Hmm. Okay. So how old are you now? I'm 28. 28. How are your teenage years? Um, I mean, I did well in school. I hated school, so I tried to get done with it as fast as I could. And, um, moved out as soon as I could and it wasn't that eventful. I mean, I was pretty, pretty miserable. I would say through my teenage years, but, um, no one really asked anything. They were just kind of like, Oh, she's just a typical teenager. And then you got the grade you needed to keep people off your back and you were just quiet enough and didn't set anything on fire and everybody just kind of let you, let you do your thing. Yeah. And I have, um, a sibling who's, a hot mess. So I think the focus is kind of always on them instead. Uh, so you had, you had a chance to hide. Yep. Okay. And so you're 28. Tell me how, what dating has been like for you. Um, <laughs> uh, not great. I feel like, <laughs> not, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> I feel like that's the understatement of the day. Not great. Absolutely. Not great. <laughs> Am I not great? I mean, absolutely terrible okay um i mean i've had one serious relationship and definitely was not a healthy relationship what does that mean um i i didn't really really actually trust him okay and makes me a little nervous (sighs) i'm just afraid that i'm never going to be able to trust anyone okay when you say it wasn't a good relationship and you didn't trust him, something happened or something happened regularly. What was it? He didn't really listen to me, I guess. Like he, or he listened to me, but he didn't hear me. Okay. When I would kind of say like, these are my boundaries. He didn't really, he didn't necessarily always respect them. Mm Mm-hmm. And I just have like the most skewed view. I like, I don't know. I don't know what's normal Uh, in my head. I like, I, I see other people in relationships and I see, like obviously see it on TV, read about it in books, like all that kind of stuff. But I don't like, I don't feel like I know what to do. 
So tell me if I'm off here, okay? There's this thing um, by Gewitz and Maidan, and I think it's Ophir and Levy, uh, the two researchers. And they have this idea called the sexual self-concept. And it's a conglomeration of things, but it's this idea of, of the things you think about yourself combined with the experiences you've had um, that create this way you experience yourself when it comes to sexuality. And when kids are sexually abused, their sexual self-concept, for lack of better terms, it, it just, it, it goes to ash. It burns to the ground. It explodes, right? And so you find yourself, um, I am good for the sexual pleasure of other, other people. So you might date somebody and say, hey, I don't want anything physical. And then you find yourself being sexually active with somebody because there is a, your sexual self-concept is my job is to fulfill other people's needs. Or my sexual self-concept is I'm broken because somebody broke me when I was a child and nobody's ever going to fully want me because I'm not, I, I am, there's something wrong with me. And so you hold back and don't tell the full truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And you can't because it's a preservation method. And because you can't tell the whole truth, you assume and your body experiences other people aren't telling you the truth. Or worse, maybe because of these secrets that you hold, these things that happen to you by somebody who you trusted and more importantly, your family trusted. And even when you no longer trusted, mom and dad continue to trust, which is unmooring it pulls a child into two different human beings suddenly you feel like if i love somebody i'm going to be a burden to them they're going to be worse off because they're with me than they would be otherwise are any of those three hang hitting home uh yes <laughs> definitely what is what happens to your body when you date somebody and I don't mean in a sexual way. I mean like in an anxious anxiety response kind of way. Um, I'm just a nervous wreck the entire time. Okay. I mean, I, and you know, you think like, well, I think, okay, if I keep doing this, if I keep putting myself in this situation, eventually it'll get easier, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> it is not. Who told you that it would eventually get easier? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so myself, I guess. Let me let me say this, um, and I can be guilty of this too. The only way through anxiety is, I mean, the only way to heal from anxiety is directly through the middle of it. Okay, when it comes to childhood sexual abuse and adult intimacy, you can't power your way through it. It's got to go in steps. Someone's got to walk with you. Okay, because it overwhelms the system. If you just try to just like, all right, I've, my body's doing this thing. All right, I'm just going to go date. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to stand here and smile. <laughs> Your body goes, oh, hey, El, El you're, you're clearly not getting our message. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to shut the whole thing down right here in the movie theater. You want to watch? Because here it goes. See that, right? See what I'm saying? Yes. Or you're yeah. at dinner and you find yourself crying for no reason or laughing hysterically. Or he just does like one of those moves where he just reaches to grab the, the napkin, but he accidentally brushes your finger just to see what your reaction is because maybe he can hold hands. And your whole body goes into a rage, right? Whatever the – your body's trying to get your attention. Have you mm -hmm. ever gone to talk to somebody? Did you ever spend some, season, uh, like some seasons doing some trauma counseling? Um, yes. You don't, <laughs> wasn't effective? Um, I, I mean, I, I would say it was help. It was helpful in a lot of ways, but, um, not necessarily in this particular. Okay. When's the last time you went saw a counselor? Um, last year. Tell me about that experience. <clears throat> Uh, I didn't even really bring up dating per se. Like I didn't, 
I feel like there were other things that I was struggling with. Like what? <laughs> um... Well, I mean, I initially went back because I was struggling with um, my my sibling has mental health issues. And um, so I kind of went back because I was trying to deal with that, trying to figure out how to navigate that relationship with my parents, like maintain a relationship with my parents, but distance myself. Gotcha. From your unsafe sibling. So mm-hmm. here's what I want you to do. I want you to go find a good trauma therapist and let them know. I was sexually abused from a family friend for four or five years during some of the most important developmental time in my life, right under my mom and dad's nose. And I'm just putting this into the ether. It might not be true, but you grew up in a pretty chaotic home environment, huh? Fair? Uh, yeah, sometimes, okay. yeah. So I want you to be very open about the environment you grew up in. And just listening to you talk, you haven't made peace with, but you are able to say I was abused as a kid. You haven't done a lot of talking about what you experienced in your own home, have you? No. Okay. You've got to talk about that. And the purpose for talking through these things is not to relive them or re-traumatize ourselves or have to go re-experience all this stuff. The purpose is because I want to have grown-up relationships myself. And my parents painted me a horrible picture of what that looks like. A man that my family trusted destroyed me for his own pleasure. And I have tried to white knuckle my way through this and I I need different tools. And so we're not just going to sit there and spin like a record player, but we're going to actually heal towards you making true adult connections because that's going to be the important part of your healing moving forward is true connection with other human beings. And I wish there was another way to do this. There's just simply not. Are you willing to do that? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'll tell you a couple other things I would love for you to do. I would love for you to get um, some sort of movement practice. And I know they have a million different things there in Houston, whether it's a yoga practice or a jujitsu class or some sort of the body stores trauma in really bananas ways. And if you've ever been to a yoga class for a long period of time or jujitsu class for a long period of time, there sometimes somebody will just start sobbing and there's something about movement and healing and movement and trauma healing that works together. I don't fully understand it all. Um, I just have seen it. I've experienced it. Um, something else, you got to get a group of women that you trust that you can be 100% open with all of it. Do you have that? Huh? Mm-mm. No? no. Okay. So you've got an anxious body that in living in an anxious environment with no other pe- no other tribe members, an unsafe family, a haunting presence that when we feel love or sexual intimacy, that means that's that's our body goes to war, goes to fight or flight. You don't have intimate connections as an adult, you don't got friends as an adult. You see how your body's going to be anxious regardless of what's, what your past is just because of the, the ecosystem it's had to create to survive. And what we have to do is teach it how to survive in another ecosystem. And you're going to have to get some help to do that. One final thing is mm-hmm. I'd love to see you begin to create a new identity. Here's what I mean by that. One where you are worth being in a relationship with and you write that down every day. One where every day you get up and you write, I'm worth being loved. One where you get up every day, I am worth not being anxious all the time. I'm worth a non-anxious life. I'm worth my needs being met. And that means you have to sit down with a counselor and figure out what the heck your needs even are. Yeah. You don't even know what that means. 
You're going to have to ask yourself this one terrifying question. What do I actually want? (laughs) That's And that's paralyzing (laughs) for people. You know what I mean? You're going to have to figure out how to ask. You're going to have to learn. I'm a person who communicates my needs very, very clearly. Mom, if brother's going to be at your house for holidays, I am choosing to not be there. Period. I am not interested in a sexual relationship with you right now, but I will get coffee with you. Cool. <laughs> see what I'm saying? Yeah. That, see, it sounds like madness to you because no, you. It just seems like such a strange thing to say. I know. <laughs> it's called boundaries. <laughs> they're they're very strange to most of us. Uh. But especially, it, they're especially strange. Speaking your needs out loud clearly are especially strange to kids who are res- to adults who as children were responsible for their parents' emotional regulation, especially for kids who grew up with a sibling with mental illness that may- dysregulated the household and didn't have parents who leaned into that. It's especially weird for kids who were sexually abused. And you've got all three. Not to mention the things that you blame yourself for having tried to tightrope through relationships since then. Fair? Yes. Because you've done things, quote unquote, done things. I hate that language, but you've done some things that you wish you hadn't of. You wish you'd spoken up. You feel like someone's taken advantage of you. You may have been sexually assaulted again um, under the guise of, well, I just didn't. Am I, am I onto something? Yeah. Yes, you're worth yeah. more than that. And I can't be the only one who believes that. Do you believe that? Yes. Yes. Will you start? Yes. You just cut out on me. Yes, yes. You promise? Say, I want you to say, I'm worth being loved. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh, that's so strange. Um, I'm worth being loved. Yeah, that felt weird to say. Say it again. (laughs) Um, I'm worth being loved. I'm worth having needs. (sighs) I'm worth having needs. I'm worth more than the sexual gratification of other people. I want this for some reasons, like, hmm. that was tough. That's tough for me to say. So when you go see your counselor, that's where you start. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I need you to hear me say that it's true. Yeah. You were not put on this planet to meet somebody else's sexual needs. You were put on this planet to be a light and a gift in service to other people. Yeah. And my gut tells me is that making the phone call to a counselor, because you've been through some counselors before, You've got a whole bunch of shame that you're carrying around, a whole bunch of guilt that you're carrying around, which are hallmarks of your childhood, hallmarks of your early adult years. Making that phone call is going to be hard. But in two years, you and I are going to look up and you're going to be meeting with a small group of women who have been through the same thing. And you will begin to make meaning of the madness and the insanity and the evil that you've endured And you're going to be able to forgive this 11-year-old who you have blamed for years. Or you're going to be able to forgive this 11-year-old who's been fighting on your behalf for so long. Tell me you're not, are you just exhausted? Very. Here's what I want you to, I want you to let that little girl finally rest. And she hasn't been able to rest ever. I'm 
My heart's broken for you, Ellie. <sighs> you just have to trust me that you're worth being loved and you're worth being well. You're worth having needs and you're worth speaking clear boundaries. And you're worth more than the sexual gratification of other people. You're worth finding who you want to serve and who you want to love and serving them and loving them in ways that fill you up. You're worth healing. And it's going to be hard. And I want you to know when it gets hard and when it gets exhausting and when it gets scary that you've got millions of us who are following you now. We're a part of your story. You invited us in and I'm grateful that you did that. You got millions of us walking beside you, holding your arms up in the desert when things get heavy, when things get hard. And I will be counting down the days till you make that call. Hopefully you do it today. And I will look forward to the next couple of years as Hopefully you'll reach back out and let me know how you're doing because um, you're about to become a light brighter than anything you've ever seen. You're going to be like staring into the sun. And all that's going to start with that one phone call to a trauma therapist and you said, I'm ready. <sighs> Thanks for your trust. Thanks for um, loving Ellie like we all do.